Okay, uh, we are on the final page. Well done for staying with me uh, this long if you've been working all the way through it. This question here um, wasn't meant to be too arduous if you read it carefully, but um, a lot of people got quite confused. So let's have a look at the language that's being used uh, and make sure that we know what's going on. The arithmetic mean of x and y is the number a such that x, a, y is an arithmetic sequence. Okay, think about this for a second. Um, if I were to present to you, um, you know, two numbers like uh, two and say eight, right? X and y, and they're on both ends, right? Um, the arithmetic mean of two and eight is the number such that if you stick it in here, you put it in place of a, then you should get an arithmetic sequence. So what number should I put in there um, that would give me a common difference all the way along? That's what defines an arithmetic sequence after all. Hopefully your um, arithmetic is not failing you uh, and you realize, oh, it's going to be a five, right? That gives me a common difference of three. So five is the arithmetic mean of two and eight. Uh, and we would normally call that the average, right? So this is just a fancy name for that because as we're introducing in this question, the arithmetic mean is not the only kind of mean. There is also this other term here, the geometric mean. You can have a different mean for x and y, the same two numbers, like two and eight, such that um, x and then your geometric mean, b, and then y is a geometric sequence. So if I go back to two and eight, what's the number that I put in between them such that I don't get uh, an arithmetic sequence with a common difference, but I get a geometric sequence with a common ratio. And maybe you've realized why I chose two and eight. The number that you're going to stick in here is four, because that means that I've got a common ratio um, of two. I'm doubling every time. The next number would be 16, 32, and so on. So in this case, um, the arithmetic mean, or the AM for short, is five, and the geometric mean, the GM for short, is four. Now, what we're then asked to prove in part one is, prove that A is greater than or equal to B, in other words, that the AM, the arithmetic mean, is bigger than the GM, the geometric mean, for all positive real values, X and Y. In other words, I didn't have to just choose two and eight, I could have chosen any two numbers, and the arithmetic mean will always be bigger than the geometric mean. How? Do I prove that? Well, um, you've really got to set this up um, to, to sort of make it easy for yourself, right? Um, you can see I just gave a numerical example so that I, was, I knew what I was going on with here. But in order to prove this particular result, I need to phrase the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean in such a way to make this easy for me to prove. So here's the way that I've done it. For x, a, y to be an arithmetic sequence, um, we know we've got a common difference, right? So this is the definition of that common difference. So you get the arithmetic mean being x plus y on two, which of course you would think is the midpoint formula, or this is the way that I work out the average of two numbers, because that's what we think of as the arithmetic mean. Here's the geometric sequence. Um, you've got this common ratio happening between the, the, the pairs of terms, the consecutive pairs of terms, I should say. And so you've got b squared equals x, y, um, and I don't want b squared. I want b, right? So I've got plus or minus the square root of um, x, y. Um, I do note that uh, if you have a look back at the original question, I've specified that x and y have to be positive real values. So um, in order to get a, a, a nice geometric sequence here, um, I want to say that uh, I want to specify for b being positive. If b were negative, well, you know, a is positive, b is negative, of course a is bigger. Um, but the po whole point here is that um, no matter which geometric mean that I choose because I could have I guess put in negative 4 here and it would have still worked you just get a, a ratio of negative 2 uh, but that's a trivial result right so I'm thinking about the positive value that's in between them so therefore coming back to my solution I'm specifying the positive value for b the one that's bigger than x um, it has to be bigger than x because between x and y I'm going to get b being the square root of xy so what I'm required to prove is that this result here the AM is going to be bigger than this result here, the GM. So I guess I'm required to prove that X plus Y on two is greater than or equal to the square root of X, Y. Now I'm pausing right here um, for two reasons. Number one, it's always helpful to state very clearly what it is you're trying to prove before you start to prove it. And whilst most questions, um, as you can see in this paper and in the HSC and any other exam you're gonna have, when you're proving something, they tell you exactly what they want you to prove. Like just look at the previous example. Like here is the actual equation. I want you to prove this. This question made it a little bit more challenging by requiring you to articulate yourself what you had to prove and then work out the path there on your own, which is an additional level of complexity. So there's the first thing, um, sophistication, I should say. Um, that's the first thing I want to state. The second thing is, 
Um, one of the things we're consistently doing is recognizing, oh, I wanna prove something, and then the first thing that you write is that thing you're trying to prove. And then you go ahead and you do some valid algebraic manipulation, but you don't get anything meaningful because you started off assuming the thing you were trying to prove. And that is always problematic. Um, you can apply legitimate, logical, um, mathematical operations to something false and then arrive at something true. That doesn't mean the premise was true, um, but you can do things very simple. Like say, for instance, um, if I start off assuming that one equals two, which is not true, if I multiply both sides of this equation by the same number, which is a valid mathematical operation, I end at a statement that is true, but it does not follow that the statement that I began with was true, even if what I ended with was true. Um, this is a fallacy. So you cannot begin by assuming what you are trying to prove. It's a constant uh, and easy mistake to make. So even if you say, yeah, this is where I'm headed, please do not start your working from there. Your working needs to end there, not start there. So, as I mentioned before, um, it's often, you know, the, this proof becomes easy if you know how to set it up. So what I've done is I've said x and y, um, they're going to be positive real numbers. That was given to me in the question. Um, and that means the square root of x and the square root of y will also be real numbers. Um, I wouldn't be able to say that all the time if x or y were negative, for instance, um, then the square root of x or the square root of y might be imaginary. But I've already been restricted within positive real numbers, so I can say the square roots are also real numbers. If you've got two numbers that are both real and you take the difference between them, there's no way for a, a, an imaginary component to sneak in, so therefore the difference between two real numbers is also a real number. So there we go, the square root of x minus the square root of y is real. Um, and that leads me to finally, now I've got an inequality I can manipulate. If you square a real number, then the smallest it can be is zero because you know the real number that would give you that is zero itself. Um, if you wanted something negative, you would need to have an imaginary number up here and square that, but I don't. I just went to great pains to prove that the square root of x minus the square root of y is real. So therefore, when you square a real number, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So many students just said this without providing evidence for why squaring it should give you greater than or equal to zero. And then all I have to do here is some fairly straightforward algebra. I expand out, um, I just get this over here on the right hand side and I divide by two to get the AM on one side and the GM on the other. So uh, that's what I would advise. Um, a lot of students sort of caught themselves in twists because instead of dealing with the square root of x and the square root of y, they just dealt with something like say x minus y or squared. Now that's not wrong, um, x minus y uh, or squared, um, you might still say well x is real, y is real, x minus y is real, so therefore when you square it you get something greater than or equal to zero. So you ended up with something like this. Now you can get to um, the result that you need from here, but there's two reasons why it's more complicated. Number one, you've got to deal with these squares in here, that's tricky. And then number two, you actually end up having to take square roots of both sides in order to turn this xy into a square root of xy. Um, and you have to be quite cautious when you're taking square roots on, on two sides of an equation or an inequality. Um, you've got to be careful with positiveness, uh, with parity, pos no, that's, that's oddness and evenness. You've got to be careful with sine, which is whether it's positive or negative. Um, and a lot of people just took the square root of both sides of an inequality without making um, any statements as to why you could take square roots and you preserve the direction of the inequality. So um, great care needs to be taken, um, which is what I was doing up here. I started with the square roots of x and y, um, but if you do this path, you just have to take care of the positives and negatives later. Okay, so that was part one. Uh, what do we then do with this AMGM inequality? Well, it says, hence, which means you had to use that result, by considering x equals this and y equals this, find the minimum possible value of this gross, messy looking expression. How do we go about doing this? Well, um, please note that the question does say hence, so you're gonna have to use the AMGM inequality somehow. And I know that's a bit counterintuitive because most people who see this phrase minimum or indeed minimum possible value, um, their brain, their advanced and extension one brain says, aha, calculus better differentiate and find a stationary point somewhere, okay? Now, there's two reasons why you know that should not be the path that you take. Reason number one, they told you use the AMGM inequality, which we just used earlier. How do you use an inequality to find a minimum possible value? Well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and the second thing is how you know not to differentiate. And this, um, this expression that you're dealing with here, uh, let's highlight it rather than drawing a messy oval around it. Um, this expression you need to differentiate, it depends on two variables, P, 
and Q. It's a multivariable expression. If you were then to differentiate, what would you differentiate with respect to? Would it be P? Or would it be Q? Um, if you did it with respect to P, you'd have to treat Q as constant or vice versa. Um, we haven't handled uh, expressions like that in the course. Um, you don't unless you get to university and do something called a partial differential equation, uh, which means you can take a multivariable equation uh, or expression like this, which has p's and q's or thetas and r's, and you can differentiate with respect to just one of the variables. But no dice here. You've got a p and a q, you've got to deal with both of them. So differentiation calculus are not the answer. What do we do instead? Well, the question again gives you massive clues. You've got this x and y up here from the original question, and then the question suggests, hey, let x equal this, let y equal that, and then see what happens. So I'm going to show you how my solution unfolds. If x and y take on these values, then what I can do is I can put that x and that y directly into the AMGM inequality that I proved in part one. So here's the AM, right? Can you recognize that? Here's the x, plus y all over 2, um, and then here's the square root of xy. That's it, and I've just done a straight substitution. You can see on the right hand side, you've got a whole bunch of cancelling that happens. You've got this cancels with this. Um, you've got, just be careful here, the p plus q cancels with the p plus q um, that is in that top numerator after you've taken out that factor of 2. And the 2 um, that's left up here, once you factorize it out, that's what's left underneath the square root here, square root of 2. Just for convenience, because I've got this um, fractions on fractions business over here on the left hand side, I've multiplied both sides of the inequality by 2, so that's how you get 2 root 2 over here. Uh, and then lastly, in this first line of working, I've said, whoa, what's going on here with these two fractions? My most instinctive thing is to combine them into 1 by getting common denominators. Now, it is worth noting that I'm not going to leave them as uh, one fraction, because if you think about the result we we're trying to prove, or the expression we're trying to understand, it's got two fractions, yeah? So I don't want to just keep these as a single fraction, these terms when I add them up. However, I also notice that the denominators are rather different. You've got a p squared minus q squared here, which I can factorize into p minus q, p plus q. So you're like, oh, that's gonna come from this common denominator. And then you've got 2p minus 2q, which um, it might be helpful if I wrote this down. These, this also, you can see, comes from uh, this denominator over here. It's just that it's somehow looking backwards over there. So you can see that I'm going to eventually separate out again into two separate fractions. It's just not these fractions that I've started with here. Um, I definitely don't want a p plus q over here. I'm going to have to do some more um, work with that. Okay, so coming back to my solution here, you can see what I've done is, I have got the common denominator, I've got this mess up the top here, but I've just expanded, that's why it looks so messy. Um, I've got some like terms, um, but I haven't just sort of put them together, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Indiscriminately, right? Um, for example, you can see here, what I've got uh, from this, uh, not that one there, wrong line, uh, what I've got here, the p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, you might say to me, you know, how come you didn't uh, combine the like terms, p squared, q squared, with 2p squared, 2q squared? A lot of students did that and said 3p squared plus 3q squared. Not, not an unusual thing to do, but also not a helpful thing to do because you can't then factorize that easily. Um, whereas, what I've got over here on the left, that's a perfect square. It's p plus q all squared. Why would I want p plus q all squared? And the answer is it's going to cancel with one of the p plus q's down here. So that's how I need to do that. Um, I left the, t, the 2p pl squared plus 2q squared over here, so you can see that that came from here and here. Um, and then um, you can see from there it's relatively straightforward. You get that perfect square factorized up here on the top, and it's going to, uh, it's going to cancel shortly because you can see that p plus q and that p plus q, they cancel. Uh, and then over here on the right hand side, uh, I want that p squared plus q squared, because if you have a look back at the result here, look, that's what appears right here, p squared plus q squared, I want, I want those. So that's why I didn't um, completely collect those like terms. You can then see, um, in order to go from this line to the line that I want, I had to divide back through by 2. So in some senses, I didn't need to multiply through by 2 um, to do this simplification, but it made it tons easier for me because then I didn't have to write these two big fractions on another big fraction. Now, because this is the expression I was trying to work with, I wanted to find the minimum value of this, my inequality tells me that this whole expression here has to be greater than or equal to root 2. Greater than or equal to 
root 2. What that means is root 2 is the lowest it can possibly go. In other words, the minimum possible value for this big long expression is root 2. So there you go, I've now evaluated it successfully. I will show you just very quickly, even though materially it is the same, um, this is not the only way you can set out your solution. Um, method one, what I did was I started with part one. I started with my AMGM inequality, x plus y over two is greater than or equal to the square root of x times y. That's where I began for method one. But for method two, what I can do is I can start with that expression they gave us, right? Here is that expression here, and I can just say, well, what happens when I simplify this thing? Does it help me? at all and essentially what I'm going to do is go through exactly the same algebraic manipulation and logic that I did before but in reverse order because previously I ended here but now I'm going to start here. Um, it's not a proof question so that's totally fine right. Um, what I'm going to do is I start there, I combine these fractions and kind of everything unfolds but just backwards right. I end up here and I say to myself hold on a second this, this expression in here is equal to um, a because uh, you can see that's what happens when I um, add uh, x plus y over 2 in there. Um, and therefore, the, s the smallest that that can be is going to be uh, b. Because by part 1, a is greater than or equal to b, so the smallest possible value that a can take on is b itself. Um, and by the way, that happens when your two numbers um, are the same. When x and y are the same, uh, you get them being equal to each other. So therefore, I can just evaluate that, and when you can see, just like I did before, that you can cancel a whole bunch of things there, you just get root 2. Um, so you're done. You have to employ a bit more, um, you have to go back on your logic a little more, so this way of working it out is longer, um, but in terms of the actual um, thinking, it, it is much the same, so either of those would be fine.